there's Hardin right there. And Hardin's 1968 article argued, it's not just an issue of agriculture, but people don't take care of the air, they don't take care of the water. This has been critiqued by several other people, particularly um, a lot of these people. We don't, I will talk about this later. Um, so, beginning with a critique. A critique of this was a new ecological paradigm that opposed this idea that humans are only social. This gets back to the sociologists disagreeing with other sociologists. Um, the critiquing past classical sociological theory is having blind spots. Dunlap and Catton argue that Marxism, Weber, they're all basically kind of the same. He says they pretend to be very different but most of them are all human-centric analyses. They don't analyze in a lot of detail human environmental interactions. So they're arguing there's a, a belief in most social classical theory of being exemptional, that humans are outside the environment. And whatever we do to the environment, we are okay because we have culture, and culture allows us to escape the environment. You might ask the Japanese or the world. I mean, uh, obviously, this is what they're critiquing. We're not really escaping, but this was the view of a lot of early sociological theory. Um, it says the faulty assumption that human culture's adaptability rendered social relations exempt from environmental issues. These authors recommended starting sociology over by analyzing hybrid topics like uh, agricultural policy or beliefs about the environment. Choosing phenomena that are hybrid and building social theories only from hybrid topics. Not building them from class analysis, but maybe environmental class analysis. Uh, trying to put the theory into a hybrid form. So, the next one, as you imagine, eco-Marxism uh, from the late 1970s. This was an attempt to green Marx, uh, a, a, an environmental critique on capitalism, just like Marx put a labor critique upon capitalism. You know, Marx is concerned about the exploitation of workers and the institutional capitalist system, ownership, destroying and alienating the workers. Well, people thought, well, the same thing's happening with the environment. We're alienating ourselves from the environment. Our beliefs about the environment our connections disappear, we're alienated that way, we depend on corporations to provide us with things. It's kind of, kind of similar, they argue. So they felt, the, just like Marx, uh, Marx critiqued Malthus. Marx, in the 1800s, said Malthus cannot be right because institutional structures are making the poor uh, a degraded population. It's not the poor by themselves they're doing it's an organizational critique. And people connected ecological critique to organizations destroying the environment. It's an organizational analysis. And it's typically an analysis of environmental problems, not environmental improvement. So it can't analyze examples of environmental improvement. That's, as I said, later critiquing by what is called ecological modernization. That's people from the 1970s and 80s, oh, as well. They argued that there are examples of states and economies that are changing their organization to actually grow economically and to protect the environment. An eco-Marxist view typically would argue that any economic growth naturally destroys the environment. But a lot of, a few states in the world began to grow with the environment in mind. They tried to integrate green social movement critique into their politics. Um, environmentalism moved from a social movement outside the state into environmentalism being state economic policy as perhaps another state imperative required by economic expansion. So the capitalist system is required to integrate this to grow more. It doesn't have to destroy the environment. You can see how environmental sociologists fight each other over uh, analysis already. This is epitomized by people like Ulrich Beck, uh, Moll and 
Wells Fargo down here, Sonnenfeld, Dyson, Hawken, uh, countered by Schneeberg. Schneeberg is known uh, as a major eco Marxist scholar uh, who died recently. Anyway, and the fifth one developed in the 1980s. This was the social construction of the environment. People began to say, well, it's not that environmental problems are new, they're just suddenly available for our discussion. For instance, some people have told me, this is not exclusively about Korea, but I'll use it for an example. People have told me that, well, now Koreans are concerned about the environment because they're noticing the pollution more. Well, it was more polluted in the past, but there was no one, there was no allowed social movements, newspapers rarely discussed it, and so it was not constructed in public. So things can occur biophysically that are bad without social relations being aware of them or talking about them. So it's very important to discuss how we become aware of these things. Here's a good example from technology. What happened in the 1950s is people began to notice because they had new technology. There was new technology called gas spectrometry, spectrometers. Uh, where you can measure parts per billion, parts per million, for the first time. And these were new ways of measuring the environment. Previously, the environment was measured as oxygen in the water. You could not measure chemicals in small amounts until after the 1950s with new technology. So, from the 1950s to the 60s, a lot of biologists and physicists were talking among themselves and saying, there's a lot of things we don't know. There's, there's permanent carcinogen pollutions that were so small before that we didn't see them. But now we can see them, and so we have to talk about them. That's how the social construction of the environment works. Uh, it's a good example from uh, new technologies. Rachel Carson, I showed you that book earlier. Uh, let me go back to that. Rachel Carson. Is a, was a marine biologist. She died of cancer, actually, breast cancer, in the late 1960s, after writing a huge critique about the cancer uh, and rising levels of death created by our physical choices in agriculture and plastic pollution and other toxins that kill us, too. Anyway, she was a marine biologist, and she was talking to people in biology and physics all the time. But none of them were willing to talk in public. They were not going to construct this in public. Why? They were afraid of their jobs. She, what is her position? She was an independent author and had written a series of books which made her independently wealthy. This is very social. I mean, she could not have talked about this unless she was in that social position. So she could talk to these people. They could give her information. And she would organize the problems they saw. They were afraid to talk themselves. And she began to construct this in, in the world's eye. In 1962, as I said. Okay, that's the first thing we're going to do. And uh, now, I want to show you something else. Where is it? Let's look at Dunlap and Cat. These are some examples of some of the earliest articles with environmental sociology in their topic. These people from 1976, William R. Patton, Riley Dudlap. He's still alive. He's a great guy. I, I, I met him in Sweden, actually, the first time. 78, sorry. He's an American. But he does a lot of analysis of surveys. He's a survey sociologist, but he surveys people globally on their environmental influences. I hear you, Lord. I hear you. Okay. Um, it says, ostensibly diverse and competing theoretical perspectives are alike. That's what I said. He, the critique is all this debate about Marxism versus Weber versus Durkheim. He says, they're all the same because they all are mostly human uh, exemptionalists. He called that HEP. They all sort of agree with the human exceptionalism paradox that culture uh, has allowed our escape, that we don't have to consider the environment as important. And he says, 
for us to integrate the environment. So all of sociology needs an NEP, a new environmental paradigm. I will put this on the Cyber Campus website for Koopman if you're interested in reading this. Uh, someone else who uh, has written about this on a theoretical level is a man named William Freudenberg. And Freudenberg recently, uh, sadly, has died as well. But his, his terms are important. He says, sociological efforts to understand environmental society relationships fall primarily into four categories. The first three, analytical separation. This is analytical separation. That sociologists are not supposed to talk about biology. They're not supposed to know about cell division. They're not supposed to talk about pollution and how it affects biology and how that's a social choice. They're just, it's just not in their discipline. That's one view of this. Analytical privacy. This sociology is more important than biology and physics. And um, the biology and physics, they don't matter. They don't have a causal effect upon social relations. That was analytical privacy. A balanced dualism, you keep them separately, there's a social world, and there's a biophysical world, but you don't think about them as the same topic. And uh, he says the fourth, or constructivist approach, calls attention to conjoint constitution. That means they are built together and you cannot separate them. This is the drawing that I put here of environmental sociology. You cannot analyze environmental sociology without this mixture. Constitution here is not a political science term, but it means it's built from those smaller pieces. He says, what we take to be physical facts, nuclear radiation, physical fact, well, they're likely to be strongly shaped by social construction. Microwave radiation is a natural, physical thing. But human beings, I mean, it doesn't really exist in the environment unless we create it. Um, it's very rare to have microwave radiation generated in the universe, outside of stars or things like that. So we've created things which may be toxic to us. For those of you aware of uh, microwave radiation and its effects on thinking processes, uh, opening the blood-brain barrier, to disease, I mean, it does this. But you know, people who design these technologies, they don't think about it. So if we want to move toward a more sustainable society, I argue a lot more people should be aware that biologists really are changing social relations. That people who design plastic are really changing biology. They need to have more communication with each other. And I would love if there were biologists in this room as well as physical scientists, people who play with materials. But they're probably not. That's his point. He says, what we take to be strictly social will often be shaped by taking for granted realities. Technology offers important opportunities for tracing these interconnections. So he analyzes technology as a strategic data where you can see all these interactions. And if you're curious about that, please check the Summer Campus website where this article will be. Um, I want to show you one more thing as an introduction to this. Another good term is an imbroglio. An imbroglio, the misunderstanding, disagreement, a complicated, bitter nature, like between persons or nations. Um, environment and social relations are an imbroglio inside a Gordian knot. There's another metaphor I want to use. The Gordian knot is a metaphor of a huge problem where you ignore it. It comes from a story about the conqueror Alexander the Great, when faced with untying a knot, which supposedly would give whoever did that kingly power, instead of doing this, he just cut it out. You know, he didn't want to untie it. He didn't want to understand the interaction. Uh, and I argue that's what a lot of sociologists do. They said, we don't want to understand this. We just want to cut out the social. And the biologist says, we, we just want to analyze and cut 